right, great. Thank you, DeMarco. And thank you to our awesome group of panelists that are here. And welcome to our, our guests that are joining the conversation today. Um, we're going to be talking about what it means to, to put on live shows uh, today and, and in the future. And so, uh, as we all know, uh, live shows and tours are really sort of the lifeblood of the industry in, in a lot of ways. And we have a lot of artists that are sitting on the sidelines and the teams around them as well. Um, but not to be outdone by a simple pandemic. Uh, we're looking to see how the uh, the industry is adjusting and creating opportunities. And so um, before we jump into a conversation, I'd like to introduce the, the group of panelists that we have here today. Um, and I'm going to introduce you by name and title and then just ask you to take a moment to, to I list my favorite thing, like, take a minute and tell us about your career. Um, it, as a lot of the folks on this call today are students that are preparing for a career in the industry, um, I think it's always helpful to sort of get a sense of where you started and, and where you are today. And so uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Ebony Gentry from Gentry Touring. Ebony, welcome. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, Ebony is a, a tour manager. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, Ebony, and uh, your role in the industry? Absolutely, Laura. Hi, everybody. I am originally from Washington, D.C. I have a really peculiar journey. I started out as an artist and a performer in the entertainment industry, singing, dancing, acting. And then I went to college in Arizona. Shout out to ASU, go Sun Devils. <laughs> I got my degree in business management there. You have a you have a, a, an alum on this panel with you, by the way, Ebony, sorry to interrupt. I noticed that, <laughs> Tiffany. Hey, <laughs> go Sun Devils. <laughs> um, so after college, I moved to LA and continued to go after my career in entertainment. I was a dancer on Nickelodeon shows and I sang for a while. And then I decided that I wanted to kind of transition more into the back end of the industry. Um, I started to work for festivals and conferences, really trying to understand what production was like, uh, what it took to put on shows, to put on panel discussions, to put on film festivals. And I was a project manager for something that's called MegaFest. It's a faith-based uh, faith conference that happens every other year. And after doing that, I realized I wanted to get into touring. I didn't know anyone in touring. I just kind of felt like I enjoyed the most was work. What I enjoyed the most was working with the artists and kind of liaisoning with them. So I decided to write an email to a bunch of different tour managers and production managers and a guy by the name of Joe Sanchez, who was Rihanna's production manager at the time, responded to me and said, well, this is peculiar. I don't get emails like this come in and let me meet you. So we met and he really gave me my first opportunity on the side of touring. He put me on an artist by the name of Zane, who had come from a group One Direction and I did that, which led to me being offered an opportunity to tour with Fifth Harmony. And that was my first tour. Their world tour was the first time I ever went on the road. And I realized kind of being thrown in the water with them that it was what I loved and it was what I wanted to do and that I was kind of good at it. So I did that for a while. Fast forward, fast forward, uh, tour manager for Snoop Dogg for two years, Melanie Fiona as well. And then with time led me to creating my own company, Gentry Touring, which is what I have now. And I have Doja Cat, Gallant, and Aaron Ray as my main artists right now. Excellent. Thank you for that really concise journey. Um, we also have with us today um, Tiffany, another ASU grad on the on the panel. Tiffany Hillard is uh, works with uh, Global Touring and Booking with Live Nation. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your role and your professional journey, Tiffany? Sure. And Ebony, we have so much in common. Actually, uh, I toured with Fifth Harmony and One Direction. <laughs> And I, I'm friends of Joe Sanchez's wife. <laughs> so it's an ASU thing. <laughs> I feel like our world is kind of six degrees of separation. It's kind of wild. Um, I, so I started back with Live Nation back in 2006 after I graduated college. Um, coincidentally, it was 
on their street team. The idea was, you know, I want to work my way into a, an actual position, and that was kind of how I, I worked into it. <laughs> and eventually, they promoted me into a ticketing position, uh, which then eventually led into marketing um, in Phoenix, Arizona, after college in Arizona. Um, and then I had a friend that was living in Los Angeles that called me up and said, Hey, I know you uh, took a marketing role after leaving the ticketing role. Do you want to hop back into ticketing and move to LA? And I was like, heck yes, I do. I, I've always wanted to live in so SoCal. So I then uh, interviewed and packed up and moved to SoCal with Live Nation. And I worked in ticketing for a few years. And eventually, um, I ended up leaving my role to travel the world. <laughs> So I went to travel the world and then when I got back, it kind of turned into a mixture of touring and independent gigs, working on uh, multiple different things, um, anywhere from Coachella to Stagecoach to Bonnaroo festivals and handling credentials and ticketing. And I also did the um, ACMAs, uh, handling their ticketing and eventually was brought back into the fold of Live Nation to handle tours so then i started doing vip ticketing on tours and they brought me out on several different tours and eventually arthur fogel and um, i was picked up by arthur fogel to do u2 tour since 2015 i've been out with them and eventually that role kind of led into an artist relations role and now i am have moved into booking which is um Kind of similar to Ebony, I really like to see a lot of these younger artists kind of get that exposure and really launch them and, and see what happens with their careers. And, uh, you know, I, I know I can never, ever fill Arthur Fogel's shoes, but he's such a great role model that um, hopefully one day I can live up to his expectations of what he sees for me down the road. So that's that's kind of the storyline of my career so far. Excellent. Excellent. You guys are really good at this. Like the the create building your career in one minute or less um i think also tiffany worth mentioning a lot of folks don't realize how much opportunity exists in the ticketing side of the industry and i know that's not the conversation that we're having today but good to hear how, how your journey uh progressed in that space um we also have with us today a, a fabulous artist and friend of music forward Elliot Skinner is with us. Welcome, Elliot. Why don't you give us a, the quick little journey about who you are and, and what you do? Hi, uh, glad to be here. Uh, yeah, I'm Elliot. Uh, I live in Brooklyn, lived here for about five years, uh, but originally from Dallas, Texas. Um, I am a singer, writer, uh, guitarist, bass player, and kind of grew up writing and singing and playing guitar. Um, and then kind of that kind of grew into uh, doing a lot more kind of vocal production and um, arranging and stuff like that. Uh, I moved to New York uh, five years ago, uh, starting a band called Third Story. Um, and we were active for the past five years. Um, I've done a lot of touring with them, a couple Europe runs, a couple US runs. Uh, we toured with Tori Kelly, uh, toured Chance the Rapper, um, done some touring with David Foster and Shaka Khan. Um, so a lot of kind of live show experience um, and arranging for live show experiences. Um, currently, I'm, I'm living out of Brooklyn, collaborating with different artists and um, working on putting out my original music. Um, I, I also love kind of curating different um, things. So last year I put together a series called Home For You. The sort of agenda was bringing the energy of the home into a public space. Um, kind of the magic of performing live is, I feel, you know, everyone kind of comes together from different places to experience this one thing. And so that sort of vulnerability and comfortability, um, I think, you know, also exists in the home. So kind of, Bring those two things together. Um, yeah, I, I love creating and, and kind of just am currently open to, you know, all that life will bring. And it's excellent. Know. Yeah, that's the right mindset, right? I'm open to see what, what, what life can bring to me. And last but certainly not least, uh, Andrew Lieb from Uncanceled Festivals. And uh, 
newly, right, to uncanceled festivals, um, career-wise or more, more permanently, red light management. Uh, Andrew, welcome, and please share a little bit about who you are and what you, what you do and some of your most recent work uh, in this uncanceled festival space. Totally. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Andrew Weeb, Los Angeles based, originally from the Midwest, Wisconsin, went to school in Philly at Drexel University for entertainment and arts management. Um, I've been obsessed with music for my whole life and I'm a genuine music fan and quickly uh, combining my skills of always get the guy who's organizing parties and things like that, uh, became the artist manager, um, started managing bands when I was 20 managed my first act called Cheers Elephant. It was an indie rock band from Philadelphia and um, pretty much was the manager, the accountant, the graphic designer. I drove the van. I slept on floors. I toured the country. Uh, and you were the guy. Yeah, I was the guy. Yeah, I was the guy, which is cool because those, A, were some of the best moments of my life because it was just so fun and it's just part of the ride. And B, I, you know, have a, of you know some genuine empathy when it comes to knowing what, what what it's like on the road or what it's like developing things like that which i think is really important as an artist manager and someone in the industry and that i try not to lose sight of um managed that band lived in philly did a variety of odd jobs from working to the apple store to uh stage managing a nonprofit kid show that traveled to inner city schools in philadelphia to being an artist liaison at festivals like Lollapalooza, Rothbury, All Good Festival, Tortuga, lots of festivals. Um, uh, moved out to Los Angeles in 2013 with Cheers Elephant with a vision to make it in Los Angeles. Uh, landed a job at Red Light within two weeks of being here, which was crazy because it was one of the only artist management companies I knew about. Uh, signed Cheers Elephant to Red Light and working under a guy named Mark Didia, who's an industry vet. Um, and from that point onward, kind of uh, shape-shifted on, in Red Light uh, a variety of times, um, working with bands like Counting Crows, Three Doors Down, Corinne Bailey Ray, um, Corey Henry, Robert Randolph and the Family Band, Luke James, um, Emily King, uh, yeah, a lot of different artists. And then more recently, I've developed my own roster, working with a young, um, I guess, indie pop artist named Victoria Canal, who's close with Elliot and done some collabs together. Uh, I also manage a 30-piece orchestra out of Miami called New Deco Ensemble, who are a hybrid uh, orchestral ensemble. And they're really hip. You should check them out. More recently, like within the last month, I launched a... Uh, online music festival with um, my co-founders Ari Herstand and Ashley Maeda. And um, we have a passion for artists and venues. And as soon as we heard what happened, we quickly put our heads together and launched what's now called Uncanceled Music Fest. Um, had about 300 artists in the first two weeks, about 20 curators who grossed around you know, upwards of $100,000 for artists and venues. A portion goes to Music Cares, which everyone knows uh, has their COVID relief fund, which is a really useful fund. Um, and yeah, it's quickly blown up into a thing that's been covered by all sorts of press. And we are um, trying to figure out what this thing is and where it's going, but we feel really good about helping artists and venues during this time, so. Well, and, you know, we're all sort of like, driving the train while we're laying the track here right uh, in this this space that we're that we're sitting in so it is exciting to see how quickly people are, are pivoting and um thank you all for for sharing a little bit about yourselves and a couple of things that struck me a lot of you sort of um got a, a start and, and sort of tested your skill sets in the festival space yeah you know that that seems to be a through line for a lot of you to to um, find opportunity and enter the industry and then we always hear that um, the music industry is built on relationships and I, I think that certainly that's true but also recognizing that we we have people here today that don't necessarily have um, relationships within the industry that brought them to where they are sort of I love music I want to be part of this industry and just went went for it right so I, I appreciate that and uh, have a lot of respect for that sort of 
how can I find my position in the space without having those initial connections? So cheers to all of you for that. And so now let's really get into the, the conversation around how we've shifted from touring, live touring, um, and the beast that that can be, depending on, you know, we have, uh, I'm sure, touring with, working with you two versus some of these um, indie artists and, and newer artists is a different, a different beast, but even in the most simplest fashion, when you're touring, you, you've got a team that's behind you and, and uh, helping to, to make those shows happen. So in the absence of that, where we're seeing uh, really creative and innovative opportunities arise in the digital space, and so wonder, uh, I'm gonna sort of start with you, Tiffany, uh, particularly interested from this large corporate space, like how has your role shifted in the short term and making sure that artists have platforms for creativity, reaching fans, because these live shows are so cathartic, right? For the fan and for, for the artist to connect in this live space. And so how have you seen your role shift sort of day to day um, how, what are the biggest shifts that you're seeing in, in your work that you're doing? Well, it was interesting that <laughs> this last month and a half, I think what we're about five weeks in now, um, to kind of go from putting a deal together uh, to how do we get creative for the time being? Because I, you know, I, I do believe this will be short lived, hopefully. Um, you know, it kind of turned into an idea that we had about uh, five weeks ago with an, an artist manager out of Australia, but we decided that it would be great to create some sort of platform to stream artists live um, through our different channels on Live Nation accounts. So our Facebook Live account um, and then play back on all of our Instagram channels and that, that kind of thing. For artists that I was already kind of in touch with or working with, I wanted to see how we could kind of get more of their brand out there, you know, because a lot of a lot of these artists are still in their development phases, and so they really need to kind of get more exposure. They need to get more mm -hmm. fan base in order to bring them on more of a global structure tour. And so I started a couple of weeks ago with an artist called the Buckleys, and really I can't I can't really hand <laughs> take the credit for the idea that came about. Um, we were on a few calls with Universal. The manager is Chris Murphy. Um, he used to manage in excess. He's based in Australia. He's a longtime friend of Arthur and he became a friend of mine about five years ago. And his team, uh, Sam Evans, you know, they've been incredible to work with, but they, we started with an act called the Buckleys. About two weeks ago, we streamed in North America now today actually right now they're streaming in south america but we decided to come up with this virtual tour concept and that you know we started going from pacific time zone over to the east coast time zone we did four different shows central mountain time and now we're in south america so we've got all these different time zones we're dealing with but it really allows them a platform to really kind of virtually tour and get their brand out there during this time because you know otherwise they would have been on a promo tour or a, an actual tour touring the world to try to build their base and this just kind of that's in, an, in a summary of words that's kind of how my my gig has shifted it's become more of a online platform for the time being to really build these artists up a little bit so we can put them on the road down the road right thanks for that tiffany and so this virtual tour right like uh, new new words for us, virtual tour. I wonder, Ebony, with, with some of the artists that you're working with, is this, is this a space that you, you're exploring with artists, this virtual tour, or is it more show-based um, in your approach? Like, how do you see the evolution of the tour and the live show in this space? Well, it's, it's really interesting because because of the virus, it's really reducing what that can be, right? If we have to be quarantined and if we can't be in close proximity with people, then it doesn't allow us to kind of create a large show that is shown virtually. It really creates a more intimate kind of or whatever. 
you know, you're checking out different artists playing at different times and, and they kind of design it strategically based on where they want to put these artists. Uh, we also have um, brands curating stages as well. Fender curated a stage, they had Waxahachie. Um, uh, I mean, like the, yeah, their lineup was insane. Brian Fallon, I mean, they, they, had a, they had a really, really good lineup. So that was really cool. Um, Cautious Clay played their stage. Um, so yeah, it's like different curators, but everyone's from home. So it's an opportunity and it's a very transparent uh, profit split where everyone's participating. So the venue's participating, the artists are making money, um, a portion goes to Music Cares, a portion goes to the festival, and then a portion goes to the platform, which is called Stage It, which anyone could use. Right. Stage It is really uh, getting their moment, aren't they, um, in, this, in these last few weeks? Pretty, pretty wild. Yeah. They said they made more last month than they did in the entire last year. It's pretty wild. Wow. Absolutely in, insane. Uh, Elliot, from an artist perspective, now you've, you've done a, a, a stage, right, with Uncanceled. Uh, so I want to get a sense from you from the artist perspective, like what does that feel like creatively to, to perform from home for your, for your fans? And then um, I want to take it from there to like, like, this is great having these creative outlet spaces, right? But got to keep the lights on, got to keep food in the belly. Like, how, how, how are you monetizing in this space with, through these types of platforms as well? Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's interesting because um, live shows are such a, I mean, it's a live thing, you know, people physically being with each other. Um, but kind of like Ebony was saying earlier, like as long as there's artists and art and people to, you know, who want that, there's going to be that connection. Um, it's interesting kind of doing it from home because it, it does kind of push you to be more creative. Like, um, and it's interesting, a lot of people, you know, are playing on whether the show was a more established thing. Maybe you have your interface hooked up to your computer, so you're getting a really nice sound. Or then you have other artists who are maybe even really bigger artists just putting up their phone. And that's the value of it because, you know, you're sitting in front of James Blake and he's playing piano for you. Um, so it's kind of interesting, you know, the, the sort of people put behind their shows. Like I did one sort of at the beginning of when everyone started, had to be uh, quarantined in New York. And I just put up like a bunch of these uh, paintings on canvases that I had made and kind of made this little like fort stage. Um, and in that way, it was fun because I got to kind of create a like stage setup that wasn't necessarily, um, you know, it wasn't uh, held back by lights or anything. Like it was that sort of balance of intimate, but also like this is a show creation, like setting up a speaker, having a good mic. Um, it, I think another interesting thing is like you have the live feed kind of going on a lot of these platforms as you're uh, playing and so you're balancing like okay I'm just playing in my house and there are times where I finish the song and it feels like I'm at like an old uh, comedy whatever and no one's laughing because you know the joke wasn't funny but then you kind of like see on the comments people are like virtually clapping um, it kind of is this weird sort of experience of, of not really having that personal connection, but um, it, it is weird still, you do feel connected with people because you see how many people are on or people are commenting throughout the whole thing. And there's this, there's this sense of, of uh, community, um, even though it's not physical. Um, as far as monetizing, it's, it's kind of interesting. I, I'm sure everyone on the panel can like have their, you know, the 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 trick ways of what everyone's doing now but it kind of i feel like it kind of ranges you know you see people putting up their venmo you have platforms like stage it um you know this is the first time in my life that i've been eligible for, for unemployment so that's kind of like an interesting thing an interesting situation i've been been in you know um but um yeah i think there's a variety of options luckily I was doing some shows right before all this stuff happened. So kind of set up a little bit, but I think it's going to be interesting. Um, I think situations like this push people to really be creative and to find, figure out ways to, um, you know, make what you got to happen, happen. Absolutely. Thanks, Elliot. Yeah. And I honestly feel that no better industry to be sort of, um, 
have the ability to pivot and be creative than in the, in the music industry. It's full of creative thinkers and problem solvers and doers. Uh, so I, I, I'm confident and, and always intrigued to see what's happening. And so it, we, somebody said just five weeks. Sometimes it feels like, wow, that long already? And then sometimes like, oh my gosh, it's the longest five weeks I've, I've ever experienced. But so much has happened and so much has changed. So um, I'm going to open this rather than point it to an individual talking about monetization models and these these virtual shows and, and virtual tours. Um, how 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 is the team monetizing? Heard Levi's. I'm hearing some brand uh, getting behind some of these shows. Um, but how is how is the artist and and the team monetizing in this space um, through these virtual shows? Where are the where are the potentials for revenue and and maybe if it's not there yet, like I could see this being a space where we could lean in, given the time and a little bit of track to, to make this happen. Ebony, what do you think from from working with these? I'm sorry, I am going to call somebody out <laughs> because somebody answered. So you're it. So you know, where do you see the potential for for uh, revenue in these remote spaces? I think the potential is great especially for newer artists or independent artists. So when you look at uh, platforms like Stage It, where artists that maybe don't have big management can get onto a, a platform like that and connect and grow their audience and their fan base, they have a direct line without a lot of the minutia of the other people that might be involved in larger uh, a larger artists to be able to just uh, make revenue right then and there which is a beautiful thing because you don't always get that opportunity when you're new starting out to be able to make a substantial amount of money on the live side. Um, I think if you think a little bigger and you think of platforms like Live by Live, who also does a lot of streaming and working with um, slightly larger uh, artists, you have potential there to connect on a larger platform um, across more markets as a larger artist and really maybe do impactful performances there that are going to bring brands to you, bring more eyes to what you're doing, and then just helps you to continue to monetize that way. Yeah. And so for, for the established artists, you know, Tiffany, I'm going to toss it to you a little bit. Um, what is the value? I mean, what, do you, what are you hearing or what are you seeing or understanding is the value for like, hey, yeah, let's just set something up here and get and, and create some music that we can stream out. Like for the established artists, um, what, what are they defining as success in this space that we're in right now? Or what are you defining when you're planning these as this was a success, this, this really worked for us? Um, well, to throw it kind of more, I mean, the artists that I've been dealing with are more kind of not established. On okay. So I'd say really kind of the viewership is the, um, the bread and butter for them right now. Mm -hmm. It's how many views can they get? How many likes can they get? How many followers can they get? You know, we're seeing a lot of different uh, places and I'm, I'm loving this actually, as I watch the Facebook live post, people are like, you know, come to Brazil. Um, you know, where this artist has never even left the country of Australia, you know, in that case, um, they've never been to Brazil. And so it, it's very cool for them to kind of see and for us to see what has potential and what markets they could really go into once this thing passes. And also, you know, it's just giving us some really good stats. I yeah. think it's also, you know, just a sidebar. I think it's kind of a great time for artists to create music because that's really, you know, that's, I think we're gonna see a huge surge of brand new music and that's going to then create a lot of tours going forward. I think it's just, it's a, there's a really positive side to this and there's some great music that's going to come out of it. And I'm just seeing a lot of amazing things happening as far as that goes, which is very exciting. So, yeah. Yeah. So with that, I mean, the, the, because to, to your point, being able to sort of reach audiences uh, through this virtual space that maybe otherwise, these new artists wouldn't be able to reach and being able to sort of track and understand where people are responding and what spaces make the most sense. Um, 
Andrew, and, and I'll start with you and we'll open it up. Like, what do you think might stick, uh, you know, as we move out of quarantine and, and live shows are coming back? Um, the, is Uncanceled Music Fest, is there something that you think would stick in this space? Or is there opportunity that maybe we see down the road, it could adjust and we could still have sort of this digital platform that allows artists to reach global audiences through some of what's being, what's happening right now. Totally. And I want to address too, what you were talking about earlier, just about monetizing as an artist. Mm -hmm. and it's something that as a manager and as opposed to someone that's now uh, running this online festival, something I'm thinking about. Um, so I believe that, you know, much like, uh, it's really interesting how you can like, point to certain like massive world events and see what's spawned out of them, whether it's like innovations and things like that. Like there's the idea I was thinking about how like uh, the New York blackout uh, or like, you know, when the power, you know, like the huge blackouts happen or whatever. Um, I guess that kind of like indirectly spawned DJing because everyone was like breaking into stores and stealing vinyl records and then people were spinning around and like all of a sudden like it kind of like DJs uh, and scratching like exploded from this like you know event that no one would really think about right so I think about like you know I'm going to assume that people are probably going to order groceries to home more probably for the rest of time right <laughs> or I think I think I think people are going to watch live shows uh, online and, and streaming is going you know it's going to skyrocket from here on out I think there's certain things that there's you know we already found out like movie theaters are being phased out and things are gonna go right to Netflix, right? I think the beauty of the music industry, of course, is that there is nothing that replaces a live, live show, right? That will always exist. But it is a really special experience to go into an artist's living room and watch an acoustic set as they're kind of giving you this really personal experience and be able to chat with them. And I think people, you know, we've, Stage it has existed for like 15 years and Facebook Live's been around for a while and Instagram Live and people have used it here and there. But like, you know, now we're in this place where we are craving connection. And I believe that even after this thing subsides, which, you know, everyone's seeing the articles about like fall of 2021 and all that stuff. Um, and it's going to slowly open back up. And I just don't know how long it'll take to rebound and the ripple effect of something like some, you know, intense as this. It's not just being allowed to, it's the, the mental um, uh, effect that it has of being in a room with a bunch of people. It's being able to buy the merch and the ticket, you know, because of you lost your job. I mean, there's so many, there's so many like ripple effects that can, you know, are gonna spawn from this thing. But going back to the question about monetizing, um, there's the idea, of course, that, you know, you can create much like people have been doing special fan experiences like VIP, right? This is an opportunity to do different tiered VIPs in a very specific way. And if you can get creative with it, you know, there's platforms like Patreon where people pay on a monthly capacity and there's different tiers and you can share demos and you can do lessons and you can do master classes and you can sell spe special merch and you can do you know once a week facetimes or whatever it is and so even if you're an up and coming artist you can take advantage of these things because you know 20 bucks to somebody is a lot to the artist you know and then there's the idea that just selling tickets as if it's a ticketed show or a ticketed event which is kind of what we're going off of uh, and then eventually i think brands you know, once everyone gets their budgets in order, because everyone's saying that brands are cutting marketing budgets, because obviously it's very specific what is selling, what is not. Um, brands will start to hop on and adapt just like everyone else is and recognize that, you know, specifically with Uncancel, like, you know, we're really starting to think about partnerships, sponsorships, things like that, because we're getting in front of a lot of eyes of music fans, artists, things like that. And it's to totally possible that they'd want to sweeten the pot a little bit and give some money to some of these artists. So, um, you know, I think it's just, you know, going back to it, it's like just a time to get innovative and think about, you know, uh, focus on the fan, which is great because that's something we should always be doing. Absolutely. And we have this sort of captive audience that's craving, um, craving that experience. And then we have all these amazing creatives that are, are trying to, to get their music out there. So, um, 
Elliot, I, I, I want to ask you in this space, I think Tiffany brought it up that this, we're, we, it'll feel maybe a bit like a renaissance of, of music, right? As we come out of quarantine and, and shows are picking up because all of these creatives are, are not on the road and um, they have this time to, to create. And so want to know a little bit from you. Um, so in between these live experiences that, that you're able to get out there, um, what has your creative process been in, in this quarantine space? How do you, are, are you creating new music specifically for these digital platforms? You talked about getting ready to release some of your, your own original music. And I know different artists are taking different approaches. Some are getting their music out there right now and others are, are waiting so that they can, they can go on tour and promote this music. So where, where are you creatively as, as a young artist? Are you feeling super creative? Are you sort of planning a strategy that allows for future? Or like I'm going to create and send it out to the fans. Um, a, a lot of that, a lot of that, I think, um, you know, looking at the situation socially, like as far as like response of how people are reacting, like this is a large, like global trauma that we're all experiencing. And, um, you know, I think that has um, a lot of an effect on how you view the place that you're living, you know, how you view your own needs, you know, your day-to-day -day needs. Um, and I think, you know, we're in a lot of places where we're everyone's staying at home and so that has a lot of time for self-reflection which i think is a huge part of creating um for me i mean even right now i'm in my roommate's room because she's not home and she's like she's with her parents and like i've made this into my studio <laughs> essentially um so it's, it's kind of been a balance of like working on stuff in here um but then also, you know, you're at home, so there's this weird balance. I mean, I'm a little bit used to it, you know, being a freelancer, but like balancing the home space and the relaxation space and the like, all right, I have to get stuff done, like in my bathroom this morning or like, oh, I'm going to, you know, go to the living room. I've had a couple of like FaceTime sessions with some producers that I'm working on or like uh, there are different programs called like audio movers or even like twitch or um even i think on zoom you can i don't think you can stream audio but you can stream like um ableton or whatever um, software you're using so I, it kind of is this this it, there is this space to be creative and it feels like it can you can have this opportunity to be open and create like creative and all these ideas but you know also you can't leave the house so a lot of the time you're spending on Netflix and stuff like that. So trying to find inspiration, I think, is, is um, uh, I don't know if it's more of a struggle than real life is, but um, I, I think it's, it's interesting because I think it's, like everyone's kind of saying, like, that there might be a surge of what's coming out during right now and in the future because I think that self-reflection and times and periods that are you know kind of hard on a person or kind of force a person to dive into themselves or or thought um about a certain subject you know brings a lot out from that um yeah so i, I for me it's all about balance trying to balance what i'm doing to to be relaxed and to not be like over anxious about like my grandparents or stuff like that or any you know anything that could be stressful and then also trying to use the experience and the self-reflection to put into, into music and into creating. Yeah, I mean, imagine imagine um, being in this situation and not having the arts. So, you're, yeah. you 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 are an essential worker, really, Elliot. For us, I think uh, you know, creatives are so important because they do help us to to feel comfort. Um, I saw, you know. Some, a lot of folks are going to their back in the day music a little bit, you know, so uh, to, for comfort and also discovering new artists. So for, for, for people like Ebony and uh, Tiffany, to your point, like people are in a space where they're open and receptive to consuming new content. And uh, I find it interesting as well, I was, as I was preparing for this discussion and getting really excited about what's happening in the streaming space for uh, festivals and uh, live shows 
starting to see like digital um, nightclubs and a lot of the things that are happening there and there's security and there's bookers. And so these roles are shifting to digital places and it's, it's so interesting and so, uh, so creative and, and so necessary for us because as humans, you know, we need to connect on some level um, to, to the creatives that are out there. So I want to ask, um, we're, we're about 10 minutes uh, from the end of our, our discussion here. So I'm going to ask a question and then uh, see if there's any questions coming in from the audience that we can address here quickly. But um, I want to get a sense of, because so many people are switching to digital and, you know, we Instagram crashed on us a, a week or so ago. We were doing a spotlight on one of our young artists and Instagram Live just crashed because everybody was on it. So everyone's in this space and so often is the case, you know, with streaming music, like there's opportunity, but when it's so available and it's so um, easy for, for folks to access, how do you create meaningful promotion for your events, for your festivals, for your performances, um, what are some promotional strategies that you found in this two weeks of, of doing this work or four weeks uh, that, that it really captures people's attention? Are there platforms, are there strategies? Muted myself. Um, that, that you think have been really helpful. Um, and I, I will open it in general to the group. And then if there's even one second of silence, I will, as Ebony knows, call somebody out on this. Uh, what works in a promotional space for, for these events and shows? Um, I can share a little bit. Um, I mean, obviously social media, people are probably looking maybe fortunately and unfortunately looking at their phones and their laptops maybe more than ever. So everyone's on there. Um, I think it's really important for promotion and something that we're certainly tapping into, but I've been seeing is like, and it's, it's important on so many levels and something I'm a huge advocate for is just community and like, and using that as a promotional tool. So building community, tapping into your community, you know, Elliot just did this thing with Victoria last Sunday called the Skull Sessions, which she did last the Sunday before that with Alessia Cara, where they basically, Victoria decided that she wanted to essentially make a talk show and interview Elliot on the songwriting process as well as things beyond that. And in that way, you know, she created something, she came up with a name for it, it you know, similar to what I was doing. I came up with a name, came up with a direction, came up with some branding, make it consistent. I think consistency is something that actually people are probably craving at this point because um, what is time, you know? So, <laughs> so like at this point, you know, so anything that could be uh, reoccurring consistent is cool and some, some sort of familiarity. Um, and, you know, in that way, Elliot and Victoria tapped into both of their audiences and their communities, their fan communities, and shared something. And, you know, it was a really special moment and reached a bunch of people. And that was really cool, you know. So I think um, in regards to promo, like, I think tapping into your community, your artist community, your fan community is super important. Um, and, you know, the more traditional ways too, like, Facebook advertising, Instagram advertising. I think it's more just like, you know, everyone's, you scroll through Instagram right now, everyone is doing something live, you know, right? It's like you see a billion different versions of this thing. What are you gonna do to make it interesting and unique and consistent uh, where people tune into it much like they would any other like reoccurring thing ideally. So, um, you know, I think that's, it's more, it's less than the how it's more in the what to me because everyone is there, yeah. you know? Yep. So Tiffany, what are you going to do? Uh, to, to Andrew's question, what are you doing to, to uh, like, uh, this is the live show that I need to clear the calendar. These busy calendars that we have, or I'm going to prioritize this. Well, I agree with Andrew. I think a lot of it does, um, well, a good portion of it weighs on the artist to really promote it as well. Um, it's a tough question because there is so much content right now online and through every aspect of social media that, you know, really has to be a very cool concept. 
and it has to be consistent, like Andrew said. And I think, you know, the way that we rolled our stream tour out was through all of our individual channels. So we have different social media in Phoenix and LA in Seattle and we really stuck with the time zone concept so mm -hmm. it's allowed for us to keep our local channels also busy with all sorts of content I mean they already have you know content going but we added some more content to their channel to make it something unique hey you know check out Facebook live at this time on this date for an artist to go a brand new artist going live and I think really the concept has been more of like something unique as opposed to an artist that's performing every single day at the same time, which is also great. It's just, it's a different thing because you only get to see them in this time zone at this time. Um, and it, it just allows for viewers to go in and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to plug into this because I don't know when I'll get to see them next and I want to check them out. Yeah, definitely. And Ebony, I think um, it's interesting because you work, you work with an artist that's uh, really prior to the situation that we're in has really capitalized um, on social media presence, right? And essentially influencing on social media. And so um, whether, whether we focus on an individual artist or just from your perspective, like what are some, some great, some promo strategies that get people to say, I don't want to miss that. I'm in this time zone. I don't want to miss this performance. Um, any thoughts in that space? I'm gonna to have to piggyback off of Tiffany. I think that it's important to create some sort of exclusivity at times where you you say, okay, if you wanna see this type of performance or if I'm going to do Q and A with my fan base, I'm gonna do it once a week at this time. Uh, mm -hmm. and that creates some excitement and that creates energy around, okay, I can't, can't get it at any other time there like andrew said everybody is on live everyone everyone's on ig live facebook live everyone's posting there's a lot of content to cipher through so you have to be really particular about your messaging to your audience as well and making sure that you're being really specific and you're making it as easy as possible for them to get to you so not yeah having too much clicking and going here or there or going to a different page the ease of access is also really important as well absolutely and that's actually a question that um came up and so wondering like what platforms are you all finding it the easiest to drive audiences to um are you using something unique or sort of the the tried and true at this point. I mean, Stage It, although not new, I think we've talked about like they're they're getting traction here, but what are some of the platforms that you're finding the easiest to engage fans for these experiences? For me, it's Instagram. I mean, Instagram. everyone's on Instagram and I think that's kind of one of the largest places that people are on. That's why there's so much saturation of like everyone being live, even more mm -hmm. so time to weed through all the lives but um i think that's it's a really good platform because people are already on it it's a uh, direct connection to you know the artists or the fans and i think that's kind of the value of a lot of those experiences mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i uh i feel i feel like um sorry i didn't know if i cut you off elliot um yeah i think you should go wherever your audience is with it like you know and Victoria's in a similar way too. Elliot, I guess you're saying like your audience is the most engaged on Instagram and you should probably go there, you know? One thing to keep to keep in mind too is like the easiest way to monetize if that's something that you're trying to go after. Right. Instagram doesn't have like a, you know, a lot. Facebook is now starting to roll out stars, which is essentially tipping. YouTube has stuff they're starting to roll out for tipping. Um, stage, it's cool because you could do a pay what you want ticket and then you can tip as the, the artist performs. Um, so you got to think about you know, how are you going to funnel, if you need to at least, how are you going to funnel your audience into a way to potentially monetize them? Because oftentimes they do want to give you money, they just don't know how. Um, and so that's why I think, you know, we, we might even see some new platforms pop up and some new places where it's easier to go and, and be able to uh, give to your artists, or the artists that you love and appreciate. Absolutely. Um, as we're getting close to the end here, um, I. I have a question that potentially could take a, a while to discuss, but um, so we'll try to keep it 
concise, but question around how does the artist manager, uh, Andrew, and a, a tour manager like Ebony um, and uh, Tiffany work together when putting together a tour? Like what is the, what is the relationship there between the artist manager and the tour manager? Um, and, and we can talk about this in a virtual space or we can talk about this in a traditional space. Ebony, I would I'd be curious to, for you to start from your perspective. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sure your relationships have, uh, it's, always, it's always a fun one. So. <laughs> always fun. Um, the relationship, in my opinion, between an artist manager and a tour manager is, in a lot of ways, the most important. If you are not on the same page, if there's not an understanding, if there's not a common goal, uh, if there's not a common strategy that you all have sat down and laid out for the artist, then it is uh, doomed, <laughs> to say the least. I find it really important to be able to connect with the artist manager in a way where they understand how you like to work, right? All tour managers are not made the same. They don't all work and function the same, but understanding who you are, your personality, their personality type, and the goals that they have for their artists and what they want to see for that artist. Um, something that I said earlier is the artist as a live performer can be something very different than what they present on wax, right? On in music. And so being able to sit down and frame what that looks like and what they want that to be, how to do that within a budget budget <laughs> which is always very important, um, is is key and it's and it's crucial. Um, and understanding just what's most important, what they want to see happen and how to drive that forward. Solid, solid answer. Thank you, uh, Ebony. Um, well, we're, we're a, a minute over, and so I'd like to end the conversation by asking each of you to provide just a little piece of advice um, to those that are on sitting on this call. And again, um, young professionals, college students that are, are aspiring, young creatives that are looking for opportunity, What's what's a little bit of advice that you might have for someone that has, and rightly so, some concern about what's the future of of my role in the industry? Um, what do you what do you want to let people know? Like, what is the thing? What is your mantra? Maybe at this point, to like, how do we support one another in this space and and um, recognize that there is a time when we will normalize whatever that's going to look like uh, what's some advice that you have for for the audience uh let's start with you tiffany you know i'll i'll echo just kind of off earlier i think that we're in a very creative space right now and i think that there's so much potential that's going to come out of this with all of the new music with all of the creativity that uh, everyone's coming up with i think everything's going to be better really i mean our I've noticed it with our streaming like you know it's it's interesting because you go from being a concert promoter into like learning kind of this whole online thing and you know we're we're more focused on live although you know obviously we have our online content as well it's just I I think through all of this we're all learning something new which is great I'm Absolutely. I'm one of the type of people that I love to learn as much as I can and so for me it's taught me a lot just in the last five weeks. And I think that, you know, meditation is a great practice. It's really good to kind of clear your head for however long you can each day and really focus on opportunities rather than getting caught up in the negatives, because that can be really easy to do right now. Uh, so really stay calm and stay focused and meditate and, you know, be optimistic because there's a lot of really good things that I think are really going to come out of this. Absolutely. Thank you, Tiffany. Elliot, uh, what's, what's your piece of advice as we wrap up this discussion? Um, I think to, I, I like to always promote balance, you know, kind of like I was saying earlier, balancing that creative side with the like relaxation side, obviously like Tiffany was saying, like meditation and stuff like that, just sort of like, you know, balancing, um, 
how you're reacting to the situation. But I think overall sort of, um, you know, in, in the space of balance, I think a good piece of advice is to through this time and, you know, moving forward, I think it's really important to push yourself creatively and find out really what makes you tick and what your reasons why you're doing what you're doing. Um, I think that is going to put in context a lot of the actions you take with your career or um, with, you know, who from that to even who you want involved in your life and your projects. So, um, yeah, I think just really being um, mindful about what you're creating and why you're creating. Thank you, Elliot. Ebony? Um, I would say that this is a really interesting time because everyone's being forced to be still which is rare, especially for people in our industry, like we never sit still. And so use that time to really think about what you're passionate about. And if you're not sure what you're passionate about, what you're interested in and make the decision to go after it wholeheartedly, 100%, give it everything that you have because there is a plethora of opportunity there is enough abundance in this world for everyone. And if you put your mind and your energy to it, you can achieve whatever it is you desire in your life. And so take the time now while we have it to figure out what that is, or at least what the next best step is for yourself. Thanks, Ebony. Awesome. Thank you. Andrew, what do you want to leave us with today? Um... I think something I mentioned earlier um, that has been, it's often like what I tell people that are coming up or people that have been in it for a while and often forget is just uh, community. And I feel like um, to me, that's like the sweetest part of the job is the music business community, the music community, just the, 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 the community at large. The fact that, you know, just because we're in our homes and the, the beauty of technology and being on a zoom chat right now, you can tap into your community to have game night or dinner with somebody or whatever it might be. And that's a really, really beautiful thing. I've been doing game night with my family once a week and we've never been on a FaceTime like that. I celebrated my niece's second birthday and we all sang happy birthday to her. And that was a really special moment. And talk about the good things that are coming out of something that's pretty tragic and, and pretty scary. Um, you know, I think connection and community is, is one of the, the greatest things that's coming out of this thing. And, um, you know, you oftentimes you getting the tour or the opening slot or the job came from a community and it was a friend of a friend or, you know, whatever it might be. It was, and sometimes that can beat out any sort of business connection or otherwise. It's the idea that you are helping out the folks that are around you that you came up with, your friend from college, whatever it might be. And so foster community care and start local and then get to that place of thinking global, which is really fun. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate this discussion today. You guys are, are fantastic and really positive and great energy. And I'm excited for the industry because these are the folks that are in it and, and uh, working and supporting one another. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to turn it over to DeMarco to, to close out today's discussion with a final thank you. Thank you so much to, to all of you for taking the time to be part of the conversation and to listen in on the conversation today. We, we really appreciate you guys very much. Thank you, Laura. Yes. Thank you, Laura. Yes. Yes.